Okay. Okay, stop me if you've heard this one. Mario, Luigi, a slime, and a platypunk all sit down at a table to play Monopoly together while also simultaneously investing everything that they own in a very volatile stock market. Yeah, the punchline is Fortune Street. Yeah, I don't have a proper intro to this one because I don't have a lot of experience with this game. But then again, neither do most Americans. The Fortune Street series has actually been going on in Japan since 1991, though the most recent iteration was a smartphone version released back in 2012. The series is actually pretty well known in Japan for utilizing characters, music, locations, and the like from several different franchises such as Dragon Quest, Super Mario, and Final Fantasy. That's Japan though, the rest of the world did not see a single game in this series until 2011. And then Square Enix got a wild hair up their ass one day and decided to release the then, currently, latest game in the series, all around the world, releasing it only as Fortune Street in America and Boom Street in Europe. The quickest summary I can give of this game is that it's a lot like playing Monopoly but with an added stock trading and investing mechanic. The game is an unforgiving real estate economy-based board game in which you play as, and against, characters from the Dragon Quest and Mario series, and every board is themed after an aspect from either series. Yes, this is a board game through and through. There's no story mode, though you do have some tours that you can go through, which is basically just a bunch of games that increase in difficulty as they go on, which allows you to unlock more boards or more characters to play on, or as, in the multiplayer mode. In that way, the game is kind of limited, and while the main game is very robust, there is basically only one type of mode of play, with two rule variations. You can either play easy mode, which basically simplifies the game by cutting out the stock market aspect of the game, or classic mode, which keeps the stock trading in. You pick your character, if you're in multiplayer, you're limited to playing as Miis if you're playing alone. You pick your board, or tour, again if you're playing alone, and then you play the game. Turn order is determined by rolling a die, and then each player takes turns rolling the die, moving around the board. When you first move, or when you reach a crossroad, you can decide which direction you want to move in, but once you start moving in that particular direction, you're committed to it until you reach another crossroad. When you land on an unoccupied piece of property, you can buy it up for the price on the sign. Every board is made up of multiple districts, and each district has four properties in it. The price and value of your properties goes up if you own more than one property in the same district, and much like Monopoly, owning all of the properties in a particular district is very beneficial. Not only does it increase the value of each shop and increase the value of the stock prices in said district, but it also makes your shops more difficult to take over as well. Oh yeah, that's another unique aspect of this game. If you land on someone else's property, yes, you do have to pay them, but after you've forked over the cash, you have the option to buy out their shop and take it over. The downside to this, though, is that the only way to buy out a shop is to pay five times its value, which in most cases is going to be very expensive, and it only gets more expensive as time goes on, stocks are bought, and capita is invested meaning any time a shop is bought, it's almost always a big deal, since the person buying it out is almost always taking a pretty big risk, and shouldn't be done continuously. If you land on your own shop, you can choose to invest capita in any shop you own, which raises its value and consequently its price. And then there are the stocks, the real meat of this game. Whenever you land on a stock trade space or pass by the bank at the start of a map, you can choose to purchase stock for a single district, up to 99 stock at a time. Once a certain amount of stock is owned for a district, the value of the stock rises, which increases the net worth of anyone who holds the stock in that particular area of the board. Not to mention, it can raise the value of property in a particular district as well. This, of course, means that it's very beneficial to own a lot of stock in a district where you have quite a few pieces of property, but it can also be beneficial to invest in other districts, even if you don't have a lot or any properties there, since raising the stock prices means that you reap the benefits with more net worth. Now you may be wondering what the impetus is to travel the entire board. After all, if you can easily buy stocks just by returning to the bank, avoid a rival's high-priced properties by refusing to go down certain paths, or just by staying near your own shop so you can keep investing capita in them, why would you go down more dangerous routes? Well, that's where the suit spaces come into play. There are four suits on each board, diamond, club, heart, and spade, though some of the larger boards may have more than one copy of each suit, and each is usually located in the corners of a map. 
By collecting all four suits and returning to the bank, you get a promotion. Each promotion not only comes with a sweet pay packet, getting you some more ready cash to buy more stocks and properties, it also raises the maximum capita you can invest in each of your shops. But in order to get those suits, you have to travel the entire board or risk getting left in the dust by your competitors. If you land on a suit space rather than just passing it by, or by landing on a question mark space, you get to draw a venture card, which is basically like the chance cards in Monopoly. They could either be really good or really bad, giving you a boost or a penalty depending on what you pull. If you pull four cards in the same row or column, you can get a small cash bonus, with more gold being earned for every card in the row that you draw, whether they're good or bad. There are also a bunch of other spaces on the board too that can have good or bad effects, such as the star, which will give you a commission on everyone else's profits for a turn, or the moon that closes all of your shops until the next turn, basically meaning you can't earn any profits until then, or the carnival space that lets you take part in one of the game's few luck-based minigames for some minor rewards. As you can tell, there's a lot going on in this game on each board, and that's its major appeal. It's Monopoly Hardcore Edition, and it forces you to balance a lot of stuff. If you don't have the ready cash to pay for something, you need to sell stocks or property to make up the difference, but in doing so, you'll cause the stock price to fall or your shop values to disappear. But that's what makes this game so interesting. The game is constantly throwing money at you, and while you always make sure that you invest enough in stock, you're always gaining some form of currency, and so long as you keep trying to get promoted and get more ready cash, you're going to remain in pretty good shape. In fact, it's because of this that, unlike Monopoly, where the entire idea is to try and become the last person standing, in this game, a player going bankrupt is such a rare occurrence that if a single player goes bankrupt, the entire game ends and whoever has the biggest net worth is declared the winner, even if they don't have the correct amount of net worth to reach the victory requirements. The game also looks pretty nice for the Wii as well. It's simple, so it's not going to win any awards for graphical fidelity, but the character models are really charming, the environments and boards are really bright and colorful, and despite being a game about stocks and economic and real estate, it has more of a carnival air to it with its colors and graphics. I approve. I also really like how, musically, the themes change depending on the character and the location. For example, if you're playing on a Dragon Quest board, the main theme playing in the background is a theme from Dragon Quest, but on a Mario level, it's a Mario theme. And depending on the character, certain jingles will play upon certain tasks, such as when you get a promotion. It's a nice balance, and I really like the fact that both franchises are so well represented here. So yeah, the game is fun. For the most part. There are unfortunately some pretty big problems with it, though they're really only problems for those who aren't a fan of this particular type of game. There are things that are easy enough to ignore if you find the gameplay itself engrossing and fun, which I kind of do, but that didn't stop me from becoming very frustrated with some of these games' aspects. First, you're going to want to crank that game speed up as much as you can, because otherwise the game becomes a bit of a slog. At normal speed, it takes forever to resolve, you can't skip through text quickly, the character movement is depressingly time-wasting, and characters will stop between turns to have a few quick quips with one another. You can turn this off, and crank up the movement rolling in text speed, and I recommend that you do that because otherwise the game takes forever. But even with the game speed cranked up, these games are still going to take a long time to get through. Even if you set up the game with a relatively modest goal, say a net worth of only 10,000, on the smallest board with the highest speed settings, the game is still going to take close to an hour to resolve. And while you can save your game in the middle and come back to it later, well, there's not really a whole lot of fun to be had when starting and stopping a game like this at any stage. And that's assuming you have people to play with, of course. If not, you're stuck in the single-player campaign, where you can't adjust the difficulty of your opponents and can't even select the character you want to play as, instead being forced to choose a me from the list of ones you've made on the console, a fact that I was unaware of when recording for this game and didn't have any Miis made on the Wii menu on my Wii U, which is why you're seeing good old Guest here getting her ass handed to her. And that's the reality of it, friends. This game is hard very hard when you're playing on your own. I swear, it's like the computer cheats or gangs up on you in every match. Since this game is just as based upon luck as it is strategy with how you invest your money, a lot of your fate is determined by the roll of the die. 
or rather the algorithms that predetermine every role in advance. And unlike other games of the same ilk, the computer characters are far too smart for their own good, and they almost never make a bad move. This makes the game incredibly frustrating to play in the one-player mode because no matter how careful you are, how well you plan out your investments, how carefully you buy your stock, the computer always feels like they're a dozen steps ahead. It's very easy to see why this series has never gotten more exposure in the West, especially its early installments. This is the sort of game that really only appeals to specific sorts of people. It's a niche title no matter how you slice it, but the multiplayer aspect is what really makes it a fun experience. When you're alone, it can be incredibly frustrating when you feel like you're never making any progress forward, and any sort of victory you manage will be at the game's whim. It's a shame, because as well-constructed as the game is, it really does feel like an evolution of Monopoly in both the good and bad ways. While this version definitely allows more people to have an edge than in Monopoly, where one person ends up with all the money and everyone else is unhappy, that feeling is still perfectly recreated whenever you're playing alone. The game is really easy to find and cheap to get at this point, and I do recommend that anyone who still has a Wii or Wii U check it out. Since this is a fun little novelty, we probably won't be seeing again here in the States. Or if you have some friends who happen to like straight-up board game experiences, well, you're golden. I really do wish I had enjoyed this game a little bit more than I did, but unfortunately, as a single-player experience, it doesn't hold up. It's totally worth it if you have friends to play it with, but since there's no online mode in it, you're going to have to settle for local multiplayer. And, uh, well, for people like me who prefer a good single-player experience, this game just didn't measure up. All the same, maybe you can find enjoyment where I couldn't, and I hope that you do. I also hope that you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you all next time.